Krishna consciousness movement has very, very ancient origins. Krishna spoke the Bhagavad Gita, that's their Bible, in India more than 5,000 years ago. But their roots in the United States actually are still quite young. They were established only in 1966, which obviously wasn't a very long time ago. But in that relatively short time, their membership in the United States stands at 2 million. That's 50 million members worldwide. And for my money, that's a, quite a growth in a, a very short period of time, Michael. Uh, welcome back, and welcome back to you, too. Thank Michael, you, how, how did it begin here in the United States? Our founder, uh, His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, is a spiritual master in a long line of succession, which goes back at over 5,000 years in India. This knowledge had been within India for this period of time, but our spiritual master's teacher had the vision that in the West, <clears throat> as industry would increase, as worldwide tensions would become more frightening, economic mm -hmm. chaos would begin to reign, personal tensions and fragmentation of society right. would grow, that uh, a seer from this tradition should go to the West mm -hmm. and try to implant not only the knowledge of Bhagavad Gita, meditation, reincarnation, but a whole culture which will give people a chance, uh, an opportunity to transcend these anomalies that are upon us. Uh, there's probably no simple way to ask this question, but what is the basic belief? I mean, say, as opposed to myself, Roman Catholic. Are there similarities in our religions? Oh, yes. Actually, all religions at root are similar. Uh, we're monotheistic. Krishna is the Sanskrit name for God. We believe in one God. We believe that we are the soul, not You do believe in one God? Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. Is it a man or a woman? Krishna is a male form, and he can also manifest himself in other forms. But there's one God who exists in this form who we are part of as a soul. Mm -hmm. And every soul is... Uh, by nature, a servant of God. Actually, we want to perform some sort of service mm -hmm. to God. We're qualitatively exactly the same as God, but quantitatively we're very small. So by chanting mantras, that uh, which delivers the mind, we realize our original spiritual consciousness and we become blissful and happy, even despite whatever may be going on around us. And now this morning when we got here, I, I was able to peek into this temple, which is so lovely. And uh, I, I guess I was witness to a, a, a kind of a ceremony. Uh, were they chanting mantras? They were all in here with flowers, uh, many roses, things like that. Were they chanting their yes, own specifics? this is very similar to the Christian rosary. We're chanting the names of God. Krishna means God, Hare and Rama are addresses to the energy and the pleasure potency of God. So this is an address to invoke the energy of God and to ask him to let us engage in his service. So this is a, a direct form of worship. And you'll see this worship in millions of temples all over India, mm -hmm. carried on in this very traditional manner as we do. We have, in my religion, uh, stations of the cross and rosary beads uh, for tools, mm. if you will, for lack of a better word. What tools do you have in the uh, Our Krishna Our beads faith? are called Japa beads. In fact, the same number of beads 108 are used throughout the world by Buddhists, Mohammedans, oh, really? Christians, and we chant the mantra, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, now, there, on each beat. Correct me if I'm wrong, I was told, or I was led to believe that each person has his own individual mantra. If I were a Hare Krishna, I would be given... No, Hare Krishna means the Maha Mantra, which is a public mantra, anyone oh. can chant it, there's no fee for it, mm -hmm. and uh, it's uh, meant to bring the consciousness of the whole planet to a higher level of awareness, mm -hmm. this type of super-consciousness, as opposed to subconsciousness induced by uh, marijuana, cocaine, mm -hmm. this type of thing that's becoming very prevalent. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at uh, what would be termed your Bible. This, uh, Bhagavad Gita was originally written in the Sanskrit language, mm -hmm. Chantal. Uh, these texts go way back uh, since the first written annals in history. Mm -hmm. This particular verse deals with the uh, pleasures and pains of the material wor world, which are non-permanent. Uh, they come and go, and how one must learn to tolerate them. Mm -hmm. So by reading even one verse of Bhagavad Gita, you can open the book up to practically any page, find a very uh, 
satisfying little aphorism or verse and be very peaceful and happy. That would be applicable day. for that day. Exactly. Probably. What about the children? What, what kind of training do they get? Do they That's, go to a Bible uh, school? It's generally of, of left sorts? up to the parents. We do have our own schools. In fact, uh -huh. we have a school about four hours north of here, near the Fresno area. Mm -hmm. And uh, we do have schools all over the country. Some parents prefer to have their children go to a public school. So we really leave it up to the parents uh, to choose how they want their children educated. You know, we were talking earlier uh, about the celibacy and the, the priesthood, mm. for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. uh, would one choose that celibacy? Yes, one may either marry or remain celibate as one wishes. If we may, for just a moment, talk about your celibacy. You've been celibate for 15 years. Yes. As a man, you must have flashes of desire, as one would uh, give up beef, want to eat a hamburger. What do, you, what do you do with those human desires? The principle is called, in Sanskrit, param drishtam, which means higher taste. Mm -hmm. the, according to Bhagavad Gita, desire for sense objects remains within the mind. Mm -hmm. and cannot actually be forcibly renounced or constrained or restrained, but they can be controlled only if one achieves what is called Param Drishta, or higher taste, that which gives a pleasure which is so much greater that one feels one isn't missing anything. And this is what mantra chanting, bhakti yoga, will produce if a practitioner is sincere and follows through with all his spiritual practices. What is Maranatha Associates, Dave? Well, primarily Maranatha Associates is a professional organization that has been put together to address itself to the uh, phenomena of cults. We do a variety of things. We don't do, a lot of people uh, either do this kind of stuff allocationally, that is they do it on the part time, something like this, or they do one thing and not the other. But we do, we have a, a number of people throughout the United States, we do a lot of different work in different areas, such as uh, litigation, uh, uh, media work. Uh, this would be an example of that, you know, being here today. Uh, we have several types of counseling that we do. Uh, you're, you're, you're actually research. opposed to cults, is that correct? We are opposed to the incorrect and illegal activities of cults. Mm -hmm. To be called a cult doesn't mean you're good or you're bad. It simply means that you are an organization uh, out of the mainstream, small, something like that. After you know, it, you can be called. Some of them can be called sex, S E C T, mm -hmm. uh, and at that point, you you again, you have to look at what do they do? Is it good or bad? Some of the mainline quote religions do things that are not quote correct. We know. argued about that before. I remember <laughs> when you came on the show. We, yeah. we won't do that today. But don't you actually go in occasionally? I mean, not this isn't you know the whole of, of everything that uh -huh. you do and actually remove people from cults for their family members. When we do that, we do that primarily in a legal, in a legal and legitimate manner. There was a lot of people who have gotten themselves quote unquote famous uh, uh, doing uh, some of this kind of work, have done it because, got famous because they made mistakes or they've done things that are illegal. Sure. Let us say you have an organization, uh, Cult X, okay? Okay. Brand X. Uh, the religious field, and they, your child or your wife or somebody, uh, was uh, engaged by them uh, on the street someday while shopping or something, and the next thing you know, they're gone. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, and in checking this out, you find out that this was not uh, a legitimate conversion or something like of that nature. It was. Did they uh, actually kidnap them? You're saying. Well, no, not necessarily, uh, not physically, not physically kidnapping. Uh, yeah, there was fraud involved. There was deception involved. There was cheating involved. They were not told the total truth of the matter. Hmm. And uh, there are some cults, for instance, that uh, you could be in them for up to six or eight, even nine weeks, and not even know the actual name of the cult. Why would anybody do that? I can't understand why anybody would go with anybody. The desire? Well, uh, on the part of the person who is brought in, Okay, what you have is uh, everybody has desires, needs, wants. Mm -hmm. You have your dreams, Meredith has hers, I have mine. And we also have built in insecurities. That's what part of the thing that makes us unique and human. Uh, our frailties, as you were. And these people are very adept 
in front of you, this alpha view, and they basically make a little package, and they dangle it in front of you and say, hey, we've had it all the time. Right? Mormons, you also consider to be a cult. Uh, yes, the I Christian do. Christian scientists, we talked about that before. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, you, a lot of these organizations, for instance, you, like the ones you've named, you don't hear a lot of, uh, about them doing, quote, unquote, a lot of garbage things. You hear uh, either it's, it's passive or you hear some positive things, all right? Uh, and so the basic difference is strictly a theological difference. If, if Meredith and I uh, were married and she disappeared off the street and all of a sudden she's with the cult and I come to you and, and you say, well, okay, you figure out it's a legitimate kind of uh, mental kidnapping, you're going to go after her. But Meredith is uh, old enough to know what she's doing. She can say to you, look, uh, I did this in my own free will. Uh, well, we, we check into that also we, uh, by basically finding out the, just how it came about. But uh, in the state of California, recognize the fact that although we may be adults, Mm -hmm. We may not always act like adults. We could also be defrauded. That's why we have certain laws in our books, and we work within those laws. And, uh, so, and we, when we go to a court, by the way, I'm going to say this for those who may be watching, who may be involved with these cults, we don't go in there screaming about their religion, okay? That is not our concern. They have the right to worship as they please. Mm -hmm. They have that right, but they do not have the right to violate another human being's rights or, or not just to violate another human being. When we come back from our commercial break, uh, Jeff and I want to ask you about that because Chantal, our field reporter, is out there live in the field at okay. Hare Krishna Temple. Very good. And we're going to have you say what you feel about them and then they're going to have a chance to respond to what you have to say. Okay. Very interesting this yes, morning. <laughs> Be right back. Welcome back to Mid-Morning L.A. Uh, Meredith and I are with Dave Wignall uh, with uh, Maranatha. No, Maranatha. Maranatha, <laughs> <laughs> which is an organization uh, uh, which repossesses people who have been taken by cults uh, against their will, uh, uh, against their psychological will. Well, the Hare Krishna, the, uh, the Krishna cult, uh, which is a division of Hinduism, has failed in India. And that goes back to... 1486 to Gaiva, if I pronounce the name correctly, forgive me if I don't because I have a biology, but his name was Chaitanya or something like that, Chaitanya, I think it is. I, my Hindu obviously is very <laughs> terrible. Uh, he is supposed to be been a, uh, a, a reincarnation of Krishna mm -hmm. uh, and so on and what have you. And then. What and do they is, believe? Well, they espouse a belief that their Bible would be the Bhagavad Bhagavad Gita, if I, I probably said that wrong also yeah. again. Well, you, I wouldn't know, so and, you just uh, plow right ahead. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what I do. I just plow right in. I'll seek up the wall, waste it up, theological quicksand. Uh, uh, and uh, which, they, that's their kind of like their Bible, which is part of the big scriptures. There's 90,000 doublets in the big scripture. And uh, they primarily believe that, uh, you know, like in reincarnation, uh, you said something that you don't interfere with cults that aren't doing something destructive or against the law, that people have a right to believe what they want to believe. From what you just told us about Hare Krishna, that's their, that's their choice. That's their religion. What, in your opinion, do they do wrong, and why have you gone after some well, of their members? To begin with, they, they are experts at uh, deception, fraud, illegal activities. They're, sort of, they're known uh, colloquially as the mafia of the religious world. Uh, as a matter of fact, they have ties to the organized crime families of the United States. Now, that's a serious charge. It sure is. It's been made in several newspapers and proven. They've uh, been involved in the murder of people right here in Southern, Southern California. Murder? Murder. Contract murder. You've made some very serious charges here this morning, and Chantal, our field reporter here on Midmorning L.A., is out live right now with uh, one of the members of a Hare Krishna cult at their temple. Absolutely. And you've accused them so far of being involved with a mafia um, and of murder. Which I'm sure they'll deny. To name a few. Well, I would think they wouldn't admit it. Let's give them a chance. Chantal? I'm visiting with Michael Grant, who is Minister of Public Affairs for the Hare Krishna. And Meredith is certainly right, Michael. Those were uh, quite a boatload of accusations. Would you like to respond, please, to Mr. Wignall's? Uh, yes, Chantal. Of course, uh, our attorneys who are watching today, I'm sure, have a lot of material to uh, work on uh, in, in relation to what's been said this morning. However, I would like to point out that uh, our religion, the Hare Krishna religion, has the lowest crime rate of any religion in the world, 
that uh, there have been some cases where people who have claimed our faith have been uh, in uh, trouble with the law, but these are individuals, and no religion can be impugned for the actions of individuals. I think if one were to log the religious faith of the various people involved in serious crime uh, in the world, you'd find uh, amongst uh, all the Christian faiths, amongst the Mohammedans and Jewish faiths, uh, uh, it's a very surprisingly uh, high rate. Of course, we don't know because the, the media generally don't log a person's religion according to a, a crime or a crime according to one's religion. So it's very important that one shouldn't uh, try to impugn a religion for the actions of, of individuals. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, the word cult as being applied here uh, was applied to the early Christians for the first 500 years until uh, uh, the king, Constantine, decided to declare his empire the Roman Empire as the Holy Roman Empire. So I'm hoping that uh, we don't have to wait 500 years now that we have things like television to let people know who we really are and, and what we really do. That's an excellent point, Michael. Uh, Mr. Wignalls, would you want to respond to that? Yeah, go go okay. right ahead. Uh, first of all, to go back over this history a little bit, the Christian religion was never referred to as a cult in the first 500 years of its ex existence. Uh, Christianity uh, was was uh, was uh, even as a, at, at the early stages was always called the way, or the way of uh, of God, and uh, what is called you know, uh, and the idea of being a cult that the way you could refer to it as a cult would be as a small beginning, but it was only yeah. small for about the first six months to a year of its existence. After that, it was huge. You know, he, he made a point that you really can't blame a religion for the actions of some of the individuals. That's if it's an individual action. If it's an organized thing, as it is with the Hare Krishna in some instances. Now, there are times, I'm sure, as he points out, that individuals, maybe they get overzealous, go out and do something they shouldn't. That's true. I'll go along with that. But when it's an organized, planned program, that is a different story. But are you saying that crime is an organized, planned program of the Hare Krishna? Yes. Well, we better give him a chance to respond once again. <laughs> Chantal? Thank you, Meredith. Thank you, Jeff. Well, Michael, well, what do you have to say to that? I think it's very important for people who are interested in higher consciousness and uh, genuine spiritual life to know that it involves a type of uh, control of the senses. Now, in our religion, which is the orthodox core of mm -hmm. the Hindu religion, not a, a divergent uh, religion, and this is our book, Bhagavad Gita, which does go back 5,000 years. In fact, the original writings, the original uh, transition of this knowledge goes back even before the Dead Sea Scrolls were written. There are literally millions of Krishna temples in India. This book is followed by some 650 million people. Now, followers of Bhagavad Gita and the spiritual science known as Krishna consciousness uh, are, are not allowed to take any form of intoxication. That not only includes drugs and alcohol, but even down to uh, tea, coffee, and cigarettes. Uh, Premarital sex is not allowed. No gambling is allowed. No meat eating, fish or eggs. So, uh, of course, uh, we uh, have been praised for our work by the Washington Area uh, on Drug Abuse, Washington Area Council, for being almost 100% effective in curing members who enter our program on drug addiction. Mm -hmm. We have letters from officials all over the world for our work in combating the tendency for young people to get involved in crime, especially drug-related crime, and I have documentation this high to verify what I've said. And we'll have the opportunity uh, to talk about that and, and lots more. We'll be right back, so stay with us, please. You know, uh, listening to Mr. Wignall this morning, I found most of his claims very surprising. But one of the ones that I would like to ask you to retaliate a little bit is uh, he talked about the women. He said, mm. boy, uh, you know, ERA and uh, National Organization for Women should really be down on these mm. people because they treat women as a form of lower life. Mm. Is, is that I, true? I thought that statement was about as ludicrous as uh, his accusation that we were involved with organized crime. Actually, if, None of you look like gangsters. Uh, never. Uh, if you talk with some of the women, uh, mm -hmm. which presumably you have, uh, the test is to see how happy a person is. And liberation is not simply economic or political. Liberation means to know I'm not the body, that I'm a soul, that I, that I have a blissful nature. So any woman who participates in that that is real liberation, and that's what we're offering. It's a question of choice. It's a question of choice, words. exactly. From whence do these people come 
to be a member of Hare uh -huh. Krishna. Were they once dopers and, and drinkers? Well, what, what you're seeing now, the viewers are seeing, is the sight of Hare Krishna that they probably never do see. Mm -hmm. um, if you come here any Sunday to this community here, uh, you'll see anywhere between 1,500 and 3,000 people who come for a wonderful spiritual festival. Well, these people come to us and join us. We now have about 2 million members in this country through our books. 80% of the people come because they've read something that's struck a chord in them that's important. They've studied the philosophy and you'll find most of them for about a year will read and study and gradually approach Krishna consciousness. That's how most of the people join our movement. Uh, are you a wealthy religion? By the standards of what most people know as religion, we're talking about the mainline religions, uh, even including the Mormons, uh, I would say we're very poor. Some people would say that this might be considered opulent, where mm -hmm. we are now. The temple, is, it is very, very simple, but it is very, very beautiful. Yes. Your sound studio across the street is uh, expansive. Yeah. to say the least. Yeah. Surely you don't make that kind of money selling incense. Our, uh, our income is derived from a lot of uh, contributions now with our large membership, which is much larger than when we first started. So what we do in a temple, because Krishna is a concept of God, not as a poor man or an old man sitting on a throne, but a very opulent, very beautiful, wonderful, happy, person who gives pleasure to the senses. So the temples of Krishna are very opulent, but myself and others here have a wardrobe of two of these and two of these, and we sleep on mats, and we live very austerely, actually. Well, I certainly have enjoyed my, my visit here, and, and I'm glad that I, I had this assignment because, again, I had great misconceptions about the Hare Krishna. Well, very and happy I, you came. I find your community to be absolutely lovely. The people are beautiful. Uh, I have to put in a plug for the food. Mm -hmm. The Hare Krishna food is absolutely incredible. Thank okay. you so much for Thank visiting you, with us, it's Michael. A great pleasure. Thank you for letting us share this with you. Thank you.